our passage this morning is Psalm 113. Uh, we'll be kind of going verse by verse through this, or section by section. So um, if you can find it in your Bible, you just might want to keep the Bible open as we work our way through the message today. Here's what it says. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So our, our passage this morning is Psalm 113. Um, we've taken verse 3 uh, as sort of a theme verse for our work in Japan. Um, from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And we are, by God's grace, hoping to do our part to fulfill that verse by calling the people from the land of the rising sun to the joyful worship of our great God. And ultimately, all Christian mission is a call to joy in God. Every presentation of the gospel and every act of evangelization is done in imitation of God, who in love pursued us first, the gospel is God's word of welcome. It's the promise of a better way of life, a life of reconciled fellowship and everlasting joy and life in his presence. Or as Jesus says in Psalm or in John 10:10, 10, 10, I came that you might have life and have it in abundance. This kind of life naturally expresses itself in praise. As we meditate on our passage today, I think we'll come to see that Psalm 113 is a great Old Testament encapsulation of the gospel message. On its surface, Psalm 113 is rather simple. A good summary of this psalm is found in its first three words, praise the Lord. If, you need, if you're one of those people who likes to have something to do after a service, this is it. Praise the Lord. And the rest of the psalm simply expands on this command. Verses 1 through 3 tell us who and how we should praise the Lord. And verses 4 through 9 tell us why. Now, if you're like me, you've likely read the psalm, or maybe as you heard it read right now, you thought, well, that's nice. I thought that way once, but I was wrong. This is not a nice psalm. It's good. It's glorious. I think it's beautiful and wonderful. I think it's deeply profound, but it isn't nice. Let me explain. Look again at verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. If our psalm ended right here, this would be a nice psalm. In verse 1, all of God's people are called to praise upon the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord, which is to praise him in all of his fullness and character, but also his works in creation and redemption, all of who God is. Praise the name of the Lord. Um, now, hardly anyone would have a problem with verse 1. Now, perhaps the staunch atheist or someone who's a devout worshiper in another religion, they might object but most people, especially in America, in the West, don't really care if Christians are doing Christian things so long as it stays private. In verses 2 through 3, the situation changes. Let the name of the Lord be praised now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Now, that is troublesome. I said before that praise the Lord is a good summary of this, 
passage, a, a better summary is everyone everywhere praise the God of Israel now and forevermore. In verse 3, worship goes from something that the servants of the Lord are supposed to do to a universal human obligation. Now, some of you may have read that very carefully, and you're like me and have a little bit of a contrarian vibe within you, and you might say, no, 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 these verses still only apply to the people of Israel. The writer is just saying that wherever God's servants go from the rising of the sun to the place where it's at, they can only praise the God of Israel. This is, this is not for everyone. This is still only the servants of God. And I might agree with you if we didn't also have verses like Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Or Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it on the waters. Or we can even look at verses 4 and 5 of our own passage, which we'll reflect on in a couple minutes, which declare God's universal kingship over every earthly and heavenly power. The point however uncomfortable it may make us, is this. The Lord and the Lord alone is to be worshipped, now and forevermore, by everyone, everywhere, no exceptions. Like I said, not particularly nice. Now, Israel's neighbors, they were polytheists. They, they worshipped a variety of gods. Polytheist means many gods. Um, these gods usually exercise control over various areas of life, like birth and death, or over natural processes like the weather, or fertility, or even activities like the arts or going to war, but especially over geographic areas like the seas or the mountains. Psalm 121, which, which we sang a part of, is, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Now, polytheists, they had, they had shrines on top of every mountain. They would look to that mountain and say, well, will that mountain's God come and help me? And Israel says, no, 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 I, I look to the top of the mountains, and I go, who, who am I going to worship? Not that God. I'm going to worship the one who made everything. Not the one who's limited to that place, but the one who worships the, the God who made everything. We, we can see this kind of play out in 1 Kings 20. There, Ahab fights against Ben-Hadad, who's the king of Aram. Aram. And, and they fight in the hill country, and uh, King Ahab wins, and Ben-Hadad goes back to, the, to his Aram with his tail tucked between his legs, and they're kind of sad about being defeated. And then his advisors come, and they say, well, you know why you lost, right? It's because their gods, plural, are gods of the hills, and our gods are gods of the plains. If we fought them on our home turf, if we had home field advantage, we would definitely win. Now, they did fight them in the plains, and they lost, but the point is this, is that they just assumed that Israel had multiple gods and that their gods were regional and only had limited authority. That, that's the worldview in which they existed, right? So keeping all of that in mind, Listen again to what the psalmist says. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And saying that everyone, everywhere, ought always to praise God, this God, the psalmist is implying that this God reigns over everything. And that regardless of their country of origin, their native religion, their ethnicity or culture, everyone owes their allegiance to this God. Now, for the ancient, is the ancient listener outside of Israel, these words must have been deeply offensive. And let's, let's be honest, they're still deeply offensive. Now, largely because of Christianity's influence in America, we tend to think in monotheistic terms, terms of one God. Either you believe in God or you don't. 
People don't say, hey, do you believe in the gods? Or do you believe in this god versus this god? We just say, do you believe in God or not? And, and that's because of Christianity. In other places in the world, they don't talk like that because they just assume there's multiple gods. But in America, because of Christian's influence, we just ask that one question. But there's a problem with that way of thinking because it blinds us to the ways that we are under the power of our Western idols. And we do have idols. The advantage that the ancient pagan and the modern polytheist has over us is that they make explicit the power that chance and nature and sex and war have over their lives by making um, they go to the temple when they're dealing with those things, and they'll pray to the gods of those things. They recognize the power that those things have, both physical and spiritual. We're blind to it. But we no less than they worship at the altar of money and power and politics and pleasure and freedom and entertainment. We sacrifice our time and our money and our relationships on the altars to these gods. But, but the dangerous thing for us is that we are too blind to see that our sacrifices are actually our worship and that they have control over us. Behind the endless scrolling on our phones, behind the binge eating and the binge drinking and the binge shopping and the binge watching and behind all the overtime and school debt and one night stands and pornography, behind all the exercise routines and fad diet, behind all of our gun purchases and political activism is the belief that these things will deliver to us the abundant life that we desire. Or at the very least, we put hope in them that they'll numb us to the pain of existence. Like Ben-Hadad's advisors, the atheist and the agnostic and the spiritual Westerner, and even some of us Christians, will say, well, will those Christians find their hope in the Lord? But I'll find my meaning in science or in work or in freedom or in politics. That's where I'll put my hope. That's where I'll find fulfillment. That's where I will find the abundant life that I know I need deep down inside because this isn't it. But these verses, they confront us. They demand that we reorder our loves and realign our worship. The psalmist calls for universal and everlasting praise of the Lord and his works above all other competing goods. The psalmist has brilliantly excluded all other worship. He leaves us no time and no place where we can worship any other god or power. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised, now and forevermore. Everything else is excluded. Only the Lord is to be praised. But this begs the question, why? Why? Why should we praise this God? Why should we praise the Lord over some other thing? Why is worshiping God better than scrolling on my phone or having a good meal or hanging out with my friends or being free to do whatever I want with my time and money and body? Why? Look at verses four through six. The Lord is exalted over all the nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? In verses one through three, we're told what to do. All people everywhere praise the Lord. In verses four through six, we're given the first half, the first half, of the answer to the question, why we should praise this God? And the answer is because God reigns over the earth and the heavens. 
In Psalm 113, the author places God over every political and religious power. No king, no God, nothing in all creation, visible or invisible, has more power, authority, or glory than the Lord. In fact, God is pictured as so high above these things that he has to stoop down to look on not just the earth, we we assume that, but also the heavens where all the other gods were thought to dwell. He has to stoop down to even look at them. That's how high and exalted that he is. To praise anyone or anything other than the Lord is to settle for something lesser, meaner, or baser. And ultimately, it robs God of the glory that he's due as king of kings and God of gods. We, could up, we can update our summary of the psalm by saying everyone everywhere praise the Lord because uh, now and forever because he reigns over the heavens and the earth. But aren't we left with another question? Does God's immense power in itself, on its own, make him worthy of our praise? Is his lordship and power enough to warrant our affection? In themselves, power and authority are tools, neither good nor bad. A quick survey of history will show that powerful people often use their power in not very good ways. It's used to enslave, conquer, dominate, assassinate, and steal. It's used to subvert justice and get one's way. If the psalm ended here, we might even presume that the psalmist is threatening us. Praise God or die. Exalt the Lord, the King of kings and the God of gods, or face his wrath. And truthfully, some of us approach God in this way. This is how we were taught to approach God. When we think of God, we can't help but begin to recount our sins. We don't pray, in part, because we don't feel like we can, or rather, because it's painful. I've had, a, I've had the opportunity to be a pastor and to be a chaplain in the army and now a missionary. And I know that people approach God in this way because when they find out that I'm a pastor or a chaplain or a missionary, they approach me in the exact same way. We'll have you having a lovely conversation and then the question will become, well, what do you do? And I'll say, well, I'm a pastor. And they'll be like, oh, oh, well, I haven't been to church in a while. And <laughs> I don't know, like I have... And then a whole laundry list of things that they feel guilty about start to just pour out of them. They're afraid. This is how they, this is how they approach God. And instead of delighting in God, when they think of God, immediately their sins come to the forefront. They start to pray and they say, Father, and then boom, a laundry list of wrongs comes pouring out of their heart. But there's no joy. There's no hope. There's no delight. There's no praise, but fear. So we rely on our good works and we hope to avoid the consequences of our failing. We don't delight in God. We don't praise him so much as we flatter him. We hope that if we keep in line and show him the proper respect, maybe we'll escape his anger. And if we're lucky, maybe we'll receive something good from him every now and then. But this approach is a mistake. God isn't like a human leader. This God who sits enthroned on high sees all and knows all. He can see the heavens and the earth. As Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. If this is what the all-powerful, all-knowing God demands, what hope do we have? No matter how good we believe we are, no matter how much we flatter God with praise, we are, are not now, nor will we ever be perfect on our own. And you know that's true because you don't even keep your own standards. No one does. I don't keep my own standards. On, our own, on their own, these verses present a God to fear. This is God in his holiness and his power and his glory. This is the God that Isaiah saw and said, woe is me, I am undone. 
This God ends all our hopes in freedom, in pleasure, in technology, in politics, in high walls and gun purchases, all our political machinations, all of them end at this God's feet. None of them are enough to deliver us what we need. Thank the Lord that our psalm doesn't end here. Look at verses 7 through 9. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as the happy mother of children, plural. Praise the Lord. In verse 6, we see God high and exalted over the heavens and the earth, stooping down to look upon them. And in our fear, we might be presuming that he looks down in anger. But what we see in verses 7 through 9 is that God is looking down in love, in compassion. Of course, there are times when God is angry and wrathful, but that is far from the whole story. The truth is that God is merciful and gracious beyond our wildest dreams, more than we dare hope. God is, in fact, scandalously kind. In verses 7 through 9, the psalmist has identified three groups, the poor, the needy, and the barren woman. And we probably shouldn't work too hard to draw distinctions between these groups, but each represents a person in desperate need, facing an uncertain future. And what's more, each group represented someone the ancient Israelite might have assumed was under God's judgment. Yet God, far from rejecting these broken souls, uses his elevated position above the heavens and the earth to seek them out, then to personally cross the gap to help. God gets his hands dirty. He rummages through the dust and the ash to find the poor and needy and restore them and exalt them. God isn't above their pain. He isn't repulsed by their uncleanliness or uncomfortable with their grief. Instead, God uses his power and his love to change the fortunes of the poor and the needy and the hopeless, to bring to them life and life in abundance. It's this gracious, self-giving love that's the second half of the answer to why we ought to praise this God. And more to the point, it's only when we come to understand God's love towards the needy that we come to fully understand the true extent of God's power and how it differs from so much from what we see around us. Let me explain. Generally speaking, speaking generally, okay? But general, general truths are still generally true, okay? Generally speaking, people who gain wealth and influence tend to distance themselves from those in need. Power and wealth tends to isolate, just like all other forms of sin. Now, you can be wealthy and powerful without being a sinner, but if it's greed or desire for power that has led you to those things, if you put your hope in those things and, and you've gained wealth and power, it isolates just like all sin does. It seems to me to be one of, in fact, the defining characteristics of the wealthy and the influential. The very rich don't use public transportation, do they? No, they, they use private jets or maybe a chauffeur. Their houses, they, they move to the mountains or onto the beaches. They move to private communities and they surround their houses with very high walls. If they happen to live in an apartment in a New York or a Tokyo, it's high up in a building with a private ele elevator. And they can overlook everything around them. They're, they're way up on the mountaintop. And that's just the beginning. Do they patronize the public golf course or do they go to a private golf course? No, they opt for the country club. 
their vacations are to private islands or exclusive resorts, or to put a really fine point on it, more recently, the very rich are going to outer space and the bottom of the ocean. Can you, can you get more distant from other people? Their wealth tends to move them away from the poor and the needy. Now, to be sure, some wealthy people are very generous, but often this generosity is, uh, is filtered through an intermediary or an organization. They get to say, I help the poor, but they get to keep their hands clean, and they don't generally have to engage with the poor. In addition, moving away from direct contact with the poor and needy, the powerful are often looking for ways to keep their power, their image, and their wealth safe. They're looking for their vulnerabilities, and they're trying to secure them. So they surround themselves with bodyguards and personal trainers and lawyers and private chefs and image consultants and personal physicians and accountants. On a national scale, these impulses lead to the corrupt use of courts, military force, control of the media. In some cases, political assassination, false imprisonment, mass graves, war, or genocide. How different is the Lord? He lifts the poor and needy himself, and then he seats them with princes, not, not princes of other people, but of his people. He fears no rivals. He changes the fortunes of the childless woman out of kindness. He gets down in the dust and the ashes to lift the needy. He doesn't worry about his safety or his reputation. He doesn't worry that his resources will ever run dry. He has no concern, concern that his throne will be overthrown by the people he's elevated to be princes in his own kingdom. He exalts the needy. He restores the hopeless without any concerns for himself. God is so powerful that he can love without fear. Can any of us? We see this power and love exemplified in Jesus. Jesus left the throne of heaven to rescue sinners. He didn't keep his hands clean and distance himself from us. He forgave prostitutes. He entered the home of tax collectors. Jesus healed the sick. He cast out demons. He touched lepers. He died covered in blood and dirt and tears out of love for us. And in Jesus' resurrection from the dead, we have the promise of our own resurrection, our own exaltation to sonship. We've been given a place at the Father's table. We're princes among his people. The God of power, revealed in verses 4 through 6, is a God to fear, but hardly one to praise. But this God, powerful enough to deliver and loving enough to get involved is worthy of our praise. Sometimes when you study for a sermon, you come across some really interesting tidbits of information. What I found out was that Psalm 113 through Psalm 118 are part of a smaller collection within the Psalms called the Hallel Psalms. And, this, and, and the tradition of these psalms goes way back, even before Jesus. And they were typically sung at the Passover meal. Psalm 113 and 114 were sung before the meal. Psalm 115 through 118 were sung after the meal. And because it's such an old tradition, it's very likely that Jesus kept this tradition on the night that he was betrayed. What that means is this. That before Jesus started his passion after taking the form of servant, taking off his outer garment, wrapping around his waist, washing his disciples' feet, getting his hands dirty, taking care of them, before starting the meal and everything that follows, Jesus sang this song, a song about the God who leaves his throne, high and exalted, to rescue the poor and needy out of love. There, at the beginning of his passion, he was reminded, and he sang this song. His mission is perfectly exemplified in this psalm.
God leaves heaven to rescue the weak and the destitute, people like you and me. And this is the last offense that Psalm 113 has to give. There's a temptation to read this psalm and say, oh, isn't it wonderful that God also saves the poor and the needy? (laughs) Do you remember Jesus' words to the Pharisees in Luke 5? He said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And in Luke 19, Jesus declares, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. God doesn't also save the poor and the needy and the hopeless. He only saves the poor, the needy, and the hopeless. And if you don't think that you're poor and needy and hopeless, you need to go back and reread verses four through six and ask yourself, do I even keep my own standards? Forget God's standard. Francis Schaeffer once said this. He goes, imagine that there was a box hanging around your neck and it was recording everything that you told somebody else to do or everything that you said you think is right. And then you were forced to keep that standard when you met God. Could you do it? Was there any hypocrisy in you at all? God comes to save the poor and the needy and the hopeless, and he's powerful enough to do it. That's why this God should be praised. This is why this God ought to be praised from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets now and forevermore. That's why we go out in mission. So often missions is construed as confrontation, or we think of evangelism as this power play between me and somebody else, what you're really doing is inviting them to joy and to life and to, and to know this God who is powerful enough to deliver and desires to. That's what we're doing. Would you join me in that endeavor? Let's pray.